Hey guys, welcome to the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over. And boy, do I have a treat for you. Everybody knows that airway and sleep are a huge phenomenon in dentistry, and they are not going away. But one of the questions you might be having is, how do I make this work? Like, I get it, but how do I put it into play as a dentist? And today I've got a treat for you. One of my good friends, Dr. Mark Murphy, and he's going to show us exactly how to do that. And this is one of our many series here. And actually, we're going to start with podcast number one on sleep physiology. And he's going to take us through screening and all the other things. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. So hang around, hit the share button, grab a pen. You're going to love this. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to do a couple things. Number one, I want to welcome you to a great community that's always learning. So there's no egos here. I mean, there's a little bit of egos here. You're going to see them show up a little bit because we love this stuff, but we want you to show up and just be ready to learn because that's what we're all about here. Number two, if you haven't joined our private Facebook group, make sure you join us over there where the conversation continues, where it's dentists helping dentists. And I honestly still don't even know how it works, but it's fun to watch all of you guys help each other. And that's a true joy for us. And lastly, you know, if you're struggling with your practice, I mean, that all we do here is better practice, better life. So anything you need, whether it be from Mark, myself, whatever, you got a group of people here that will sit down, listen to you. So check it out at actdental.com. Whatever you need, you're going to see, uh, I'll give you Mark's email address. He's one of the most giving people ever and just a great teacher. So you are in for a huge treat today. So Mark, today we're going to be talking about this whole sleep physiology thing. Now, I always like this. Before we get started, people got to know who you are. Now, I joke, and I said this last time we were on, you're like the, not only are you a great teacher, you're a great person, but you're the, like, you make learning fun. If people have never heard who Mark Murphy is, Dr. Mark Murphy, who is Dr. Mark Murphy? Who are you, brother? Look, <laughs> if you had one chance or one opportunity, seize every year, every one in one moment, would you capture it? Would you let us know? <laughs> Yo, his hands are no. Um, being from Detroit, I can rap just a little bit, you know, just enough to get it started. But no, uh, I wish you could get more excited uh, when you're introducing somebody or, or a topic because, you know, you just, you're monotone. People are dozing off right now. They have no idea. Um, you're right, though. You are an incredible resource. ActDental.com is an incredible resource. You're right in to tap into some of the people that you work with. Um, you, you work with a lot of giving people. And Kirk, that allows you to have a broader network of support, uh, helping doctors be more successful, helping their practices grow, helping them grow as individuals. So thanks for all that you do for the profession. You really made a, a big difference. I've known you a long time. We met down at the Panky Institute about a long time ago. We'll just leave it a long time ago. You had hair. I don't think you ever had Not hair. Did you ever have hair? I had a little bit of hair. Even my kids look at those photos and they're like, "Who, Dad, what is that? I'm like, I wasn't that cool back then. Now, when I did have here, I told this one last time we stayed in the condos together. You made me sleep on the couch because there was no there was no room at the inn. <laughs> so, you know, that worked out pretty well for somebody else one time. I'm just saying it did. a couple it did. thousand years ago, worked out pretty well for somebody else. So you'll have to roll with that. No. So I, I'm just a dentist like everybody else that, that's in here. And um, I've had the fortune of being involved in sleep for a long time. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I started back into practice a little bit part time, just doing dental sleep. No dentistry at all, just dental sleep medicine. But I work for Prasanda Sleep Technologies, so I'm their lead clinical faculty. So I lecture, I teach, I do things like this. I do webinars. Um, I, I help hold the hands, if you will, of a lot of young dentists who are getting started in dental sleep medicine. I also help sometimes some of the dentists who are much more proficient at it already. We do sort of like you would do. We do some practice management to help them with their teams, but really very narrow, very specific, growing sleep. And I do that as a service for Prosomnus as part of our relationship with our customers, clients. So that's kind of how I spend most of my time. That's my full-time gig. Yeah. And so doing these kinds of things or practicing part-time one day a week, doing dental sleep medicine keeps me wet-handed so I can say I still know what I'm talking about when I talk about it, not yeah. just reading from a book. I feel like every time I talk about occlusion now or something like that, I'm like, you know, somebody's going to say, when was the last time you delivered a bite splint? When was the last time you did an equilibration? And I'm going to get burned because I'm going to say, well, it's been a while, you know, and you can't a while, you know, somebody's going to pin you down. Whereas if you've just done one sleep device and somebody says, well, have you done this before? You could say, I've done a number of these because one is a number. 
<laughs> so you could say that, but the other way around, when was the last time you get stuck? You do. So that's, so that's all. And, and so I appreciate you having me back. You know, we did, we did a program a while, a while ago talking about a variety of things, including sleep. Yeah. And so now to have me back after you and I, I think you got very interested in it yourself. So now the possibility of sitting down and breaking this into sessions, like we're going to do, we'll have six conversations about dental sleep medicine and you'll, you know, spread those out like you would not like manure on the field, but you know, like seed and, and food and everything for growth on the field. But if some of your docs decide they, they're interested in something I sleep, this will be a conduit for them to kind of dip their toe in it. Right. It's not like they've got to sign up for a big course. It's not like they've got to travel somewhere, be involved for, I think the mastery program for the ADSM is three weekends, um, two and a half days each weekend. So it's all day Friday, all day Saturday, half day Sunday. So it's a big investment of time, effort, energy, and money. This is a way for them to figure out, hey, is this for me? Right. And the good thing is the first couple of programs we'll do will help them understand sleep a little bit and help them understand screening a little bit. So even if they think it's not for them, at least they'll, they'll know what they need to know to do a good job of screening their patients. So I think that'll help them get started. Absolutely. And I want to start here too, because I'm not a little interested in this. I'm very interested in this because sleep's not going away. And then Mark, speak to this. It's not going away. The problem is people don't know the algorithm of how to make this work. And you see this all, I hear it on the road all the time. I oh, get really? it. I just don't see how I could make that work when I'm doing a lot of, you know, I do, I, I'm in a small town. I do a lot of general dentistry. I don't have, you know, totally. Totally. You know, a functional therapist. So, you hear so let, me, let, me, let me go to the end of the road there. Um, right. Covey would tell us to begin with the end in mind, right? So we're going to begin with the end in mind. We'll go way out there. And I'll say in our last session, we're going to talk a little bit about billing and documentation. Okay. Oh. And I would tell you that if you took a hundred new dentists who had gotten into sleep and tried to do something with sleep and 80 of them failed to get started, really 80 of them maybe struggled to get an anchor in sleep. And you said to them, what was the problem? 60 of those 80 would say, I couldn't get paid. I couldn't find a way to get paid doing sleep. And the other 20 would say, this documentation was driving me crazy. I'm writing letters to physicians. I've got these templates and I'm writing all these letters. I would get done seeing four patients and I'd have an hour and a half for the work to do at the end of the day. And here's what I will tell you. That's how long it takes to solve both those problems. But it also takes, I don't have my wallet in my pocket, so I can't pull out my wallet as a demonstrative uh, a prop or anything like that. So you could pull out your wallet and say, and it takes a little bit of this. So you, if you say, I'm going to make a couple grand doing a sleep device or three grand doing a sleep device, you go high five. That's great. Just be willing to give up eight or 10% of that to a billing company. Right. And if you're willing to hire a third party, just like you'd have to hire a team member, or you could frustrate the living hell out of your existing team members by getting them to try to bill sleep. And when they get frustrated enough, they'll quit. And then you'll really hate sleep because now you lost your best, you know, best front desk person or administrator or auxiliary, something like that. Instead, you just got to pay the bill. And then right. you have to have a software platform. So I'm going to go right to the end and I'm going to say, if you want sleep to work, the dental part of doing simple, we're going to talk about it. It's easy. But the billing and the documentation, the communicating with physicians, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where it gets tricky. And if you try to do it yourself, it's like brain surgery, baby. You're going to screw it up. And that's why we're showing up here. I mean, this is going to be a treat because talking about best practices, we got one of the best that's going to show us. This. And as a dentist, you know this, they need the recipe. I need the steps. You can't tell me, you know, subjectively how to prep a crown. I got to watch you do <laughs> it. And I got to learn how to do this. Now, I do want to ask this. You're a guy that's passionate about dentist, dentistry. Like you, you've done the full circle of why, you know, occlusion, why does this particular segment of dentistry light your fire so much? That, that is a good question. Thanks for that. So, Kirk, you know, I am a sleep apnea, so I suffer from sleep apnea. And so in 2012, I was diagnosed. I've been involved with treating dental sleep for 30 years. I made my first sleep device 30 years ago teaching with, teaching with Keith Thornton down at the Pankey Institute. And it was a TMD course. We are treating uh, chronic pain, fibromyalgia. We're talking about the medications for that. And he's saying, you know, you really got to be involved in sleep if you're going to do this. And he kind of nudged me over into the sleep side. And I made my first few tap devices, treated some sleep patients the wrong way back then, by the way. We were making all kinds of mistakes. It wasn't very scientific, but we helped people. We helped people stop snoring. We helped people sleep better. I'm sure we lowered their AHI 
HI scores. We'll learn about that in the next couple of sessions. Uh, we, we lower their HI scores, we made them better, but we weren't testing them, we weren't treating them, we weren't communicating with physicians. The devices sucked, they were pieces of crap. So I did that and I knew it was important. Got caught up in myself, got caught up in dentistry, got caught up in teaching, got caught up in occlusion. I was in occlusion all the time. My practice was primarily adults, occlusal rehab kind of cases, excuse me. And so I had a lot of fun doing that kind of stuff. And then when I woke up in 2012 and I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, kind of all of that previous learning came back to me. And then oddly enough, shortly after that, I was doing some lecturing and teaching for microdental laboratories and they wanted to develop a sleep device. And I had a lot of teaching and education responsibility with them. It was a small part of my year, maybe 25%, 30% of my, of my year was contracts with them, doing things, teaching and lecturing and stuff. And I said to them, I happen to have some expertise in that arena. And the next thing I know, I'm caught up in this vortex of energy of developing sleep devices for microdental laboratories. Fast forward in 2016, the product that we developed inside there spun out as a separate company. It wasn't my product, it was their product. And it spun out as a company that wasn't my company, it's their company. And uh, I do some lecturing and teaching now for Prosomnus, which is the company that that product became eventually. And Microdental sold to Modern Dental. So I've been on this path and I found that there is nothing I've seen in dentistry that is even remotely more rewarding than feeling like you saved somebody's life, feeling like you maybe saved somebody's marriage, feeling like you got two people back in the bedroom together that were having trouble sleeping. And, and, and sometimes it's not as, as, as glamorous and sexy as all that. Sometimes it's, uh, it's I text the patient the next morning and I say, how'd you sleep last night? And the patient sends me a picture of her dog laying on the pillow. And I say, what's that? And she says, that's Sully. Sully hasn't stayed in bed with me for years because I snore. And it's the first time my dog stayed in bed with me in years. This is a divorced woman who sleeps by herself or with Sully, her little multi-poo or whatever kind of cute little white dog that fluff of bundly fur was. So when you have those kind of differences in people's lives, I mean, it's like the feeling you get when you change somebody's smile or you get somebody out of pain, you get somebody comfortable again, times three or times five or times 10. And honestly, the, the hard part to explain to people is it's super easy to do. It's, right. it's, it's easier than a bite splint. It's easier than um, 10 veneers. It's easier than an occlusal rehab case. It's so much easier to do the dental part of it. Now, the harder part of it, billing, communication, documentation, all that kind of crap. So there's this, there's this environment around dental sleep medicine, just like there's an environment around dentistry that we have to get used to. And we right. have to find a way to work through and around. And that new environment, the medical side of it is different. Right. And, and if we don't want to learn the, the new and we just want to stay with what's old, then that different is very negative to us and very foreign to us and very uncomfortable to us. And, and we let it get in our way. And, and you know, growth only comes from finding ways to get past some of those barriers that seem to be in our way, whether it's working out and getting healthier, whether it's family time, you know, whether it's your golf game, it could be anything. You just got to find ways to work through those barriers, but it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And, you know, I'm in the autumn of my career. I'm, I, I might have hair, but it's this color, right? And it's getting a tremendous glare from the lights. And, uh, and, I, and, and I've always said this, I, I never knew what it would be, but I wanted to leave my mark in dentistry. I, it doesn't have to be my name on a building. And I've given a bunch of money to the Panky Institute, so they'll put my name on a wall and stuff like that. But it's, it's not, that's not what I'm looking for when I say, I want to make a difference in people's lives. And so when I teach, when you teach, you feel this, when you, when you nudge people and they move into the right direction, you see them better off next year than they were this year for some reason. Oh yeah. That's, that replaces a lot of money. That feels oh, good. So it, I love doing this. I love it, doing this. It's the journey you're talking about the significance part, you know, cause you and I, we were in the throes of it years ago when you're like, it's all about success. And then there's a certain day you wake up, you're like, clock's ticking, man. I got to make an impact and get something done. And then it, you're nothing makes you happier than running to somebody on the road. And they go, you know, I heard you 10 years ago. I can't remember what you said, but you said one thing. And man, I started coaching my kids' soccer teams. And I'll tell you what, my kid, you know, and you're just like, that's, that was worth it right there. And Mark, it, you don't have to be a speaker for that. You know, how this is people fix teeth. Oh. You know, there's two types of practice. You can fix teeth or you can change lives. Now, both of them are good, but there's, those are two different businesses. You know, one sure. is, 
committed. And what you're talking about right here, let's just say it out loud. Dentists are always resistant to, to like big thinking change. Heck, you know, dentists were supposed to go away when fluoride came onto the scene, but that, you know, you know how that all worked out. I don't know. I don't know if they're resistant to big thinking change. They're there. We are resistant to change. We just are. We're resistant to change. We just are. How many, how, many, how many dentists does it take to change the light bulb? It takes five, one to change the light bulb, and four to sit around and talk about how great the old one was. I'm that guy. I'm that guy. No, Kevin they're, Quichy, they're, you know, you know they're, Kevin Quichy. Kevin's awesome, yeah. Kevin comes walking up to me at a dental sleep medicine meeting, and we're taking impressions using a Nitero or a three-shape scanner. I can't even remember. I've got a medic now. It doesn't matter, but we're scanning bites, and we've got our bite forks in there, and we got some goop on the bite forks, and we're taking these things and they're special bike forks with little pads and it's all cool. And he comes walking up, Hey Murph, how you doing? Hey, good. He says, what are you doing there? And I tell him what we're doing. He goes, why do you put goop on it when you do that? And I look at him and I go, cause, cause we always did. Yeah. <laughs> no. and then, and he, he throws me 360 upside down and backwards saying, you know, you could just put the bike fork in and it holds your jaw in position. You don't have to put any goop on it, scan them done. And I'm like, yeah, but we've always done it that way. <laughs> he just and starts you, laughing. You said, shut up, kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I would argue, uh, let me go back to that. It doesn't take five dentists to change a light bulb. There's a sixth one that's slowing it down because they're using those seven most expensive words in business. That's the way we've always done it. Don't, no, no, no. Don't, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm, yeah. I'm guilty. You know that. You know, oh. we've talked about it. Me too. So, yeah. But let's go into this because this is sure. the topic today. We're going to be talking about sleep physiology. I am a, I am a, I'm, I'm diagnosed as it's been 10 years now. So this is a huge challenge for me. And we talked about it last time. And uh, I know it's not just an issue in dentistry, but dentists themselves are facing it. Their children are facing This is a problem that we see everywhere. Yeah. And a lot of this is dispelling the myth. The myth. I was an I mean, I was doing triathlons and my buddy, I was having chest pain and my buddy said, you know, we should do like a sleep test. I'm like, that's for, you know, I don't fit that category at all. And he's like, oh, don't be so sure and turn my life upside down. So let's get into the yeah. sleep physiology, you know, aspect. Of what is it? Where do I so, start? So it, it starts with making sure that from a nutritional standpoint, I'm going to, I'm going to oversimplify this whole thing from a nutritional standpoint. We need to make sure we're getting in all of our absolutely important major uh, uh, nutrients that we have on a daily basis, right? No question about it. You've got to get a balanced nutrition. You know, we take some things for granted. We take water for granted. There's a lot of people that live most of their lives somewhat dehydrated, and it has a huge impact on their physiology. Now, that's a daytime and a nighttime thing. Oxygen, though, is not ever listed as one of the important major six nutrients. And yet I would argue that it is the forgotten nutrient because you can survive without breathing well, but you can't survive without breathing and you will be compromised if you're not breathing well. If you're not getting enough of, just put in that parameter, of an essential nutrient, you will begin to show a deficiency in that nutrient. And if that nutrient is oxygen, you'd say, how can we be deficient in oxygen? There's so much around. Of course there is. And during the day, you'll always be bringing enough of that nutrient in because you're conscious and awake and breathing. But at night, our anatomy, our physiology, our weight gain, the fact that our uvula in the back of the throat and the epiglottis don't overlap like they do in every other mammal leaves us prone. We're the only mammal, the only mammal that gets sleep apnea. So it leaves us prone to this disease. The chronic disease is we don't get enough air at night and our blood oxygen level drops. Flow drops, oxygen drops. And what happens is while you're laying there resting, your body says, wake the hell up. You're not getting enough oxygen. When you're standing up, if your brain does not get enough oxygen, you faint. And you faint very simply because your brain is super sensitive to getting enough oxygen. And if it doesn't get enough oxygen, it says, go horizontal, baby. Right. I need to make the heart's job to get blood up here easier. I need gravity on my side and it takes you down. Right. When you're sleeping, you're already down and you're supposed to be resting. So the only tool it has is a bolt of lightning, a punch in the face from your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. And that's epinephrine. That's adrenaline. 
And if that happens once, two, three, four times an hour, no big deal. That's actually normal to have a couple, three of those per hour. But when you have 10 or 20 or 30 or 60, once a minute, you're supposed to be sleeping and resting, rejuvenating your body, rejuvenating your brain. And every minute or two or three or four, you have to wake up, not consciously awake, but just wake up enough to make sure that you oxygenate better. Your sleep gets jacked. Yeah. And when your sleep gets jacked, your heart gets jacked, your pancreas gets jacked, your digestive system gets jacked, your, your blood flow to the brain gets jacked, everything. Your heart races up and your blood pressure jumps up and you're a mess. Right. And you wake up the next day and you may feel tired. You may have a little bit of a cognitive fog, a tiny bit, but that might happen for you every day so that you don't notice that as abnormal. That becomes your new normal. Right. Yeah, so, sure. And, and, if you're listening to this in your 40s, you know it gets jacked on your sleep. But let's take that is just the tip of the iceberg, my friend. Think about an eight-year-old kid whose system is jacked. Totally. And the ripple effect on mental health, their ability to eat well, function during the day. I mean, you're talking, this is a huge epidemic. And dentists are right in the throes of it to be able to make this world a healthier place. Don't you think? 100% agree. And, and, and you're right. It is a huge epidemic. 20 to 25% of the adult population has obstructive sleep apnea. And, and as high as 85 to 90% of those people have never been diagnosed. So if you're in an average dental practice of a couple thousand patients and you have 25%, say 500. Right. And 90% of those, say 450 have never been diagnosed, you have four or 450 or 500 patients walking around with a very serious disease that we just don't pay a lot of attention to. We kind of accept poor sleep. Now, we don't really accept poor sleep because you can't turn on your TV without seeing an ad for a new mattress or Inspire or a certain kind of pillow or, or, or. Sleep is we know we're sleep deprived as a country, as a nation, probably as a world, but just talking about North America right now, we're sleep deprived. And part of that is, you know, maybe working too many hours. Part of that is maybe staying up too late. Part of that is probably all the, the blue light we get from all of the uh, cell phones and televisions and, and iPads that we play with. But a lot of that is also that we sleep for crap. Yeah, absolutely. Or not just the sleep products, but the countermeasures like the five hour energy, you know, and all, oh, man. <laughs> which so, is just like poison in a bottle, I think, but you know. 100%. So I saw an ad the other day for a new FDA approved drug, prescription only, that if you suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, you can take this to be more alert during the day. Oh, really? So instead of getting at the root cause of the problem, we're going to find a way to obtund your signs and symptoms so that you don't maybe get treatment and you function better every day. And we'll just burn you out faster. Right. It's horrible. So right. the army is the, uh, is Persomnus's largest customer. Wow. The army, United States army. And here's why they believe very strongly that to put a soldier in the field to do what a soldier has to do, they got to make some pretty critical decisions with their hand on the trigger their hand on a weapon system, right? Right. That they have to be at the highest level of fitness, nutrition, and the third item in their readiness triad, they call it their readiness triad, is fitness, nutrition, and sleep. Wow. And they feel yeah. sleep is just as important as the other two. Oh, my gosh. And you don't have to go far to find – I mean – you know, LeBron sleeps in a sleep chamber, what, 12 hours a day? And then you've got people it's that- It's a secret have weapon. It's a secret weapon. Roger Federer said in his height of his career, it was 10 hours a day. Tom, Tom Brady, Brady, who I- Super Bowl. I, I can't even- uh, I, I actually don't hate the guy. I hate playing against him because I'm a Green Bay Packer fan and I'm on the losing end of it. But he's going to get his seventh ring if he wins on- Now, Patrick Mahomes. But here's the thing. He sleeps on average. You know the number. How many hours a night? Nine hours. Nine to, ten. Nine to ten. And he says so, that is his secret weapon. I, as a Green Bay Packer fan, I apologize. That's the only major football stadium that has never hosted a Super Bowl because Not of the weather. 
So, and, and they probably never will. And so, oh, it just hurts my heart. Um, so I'm, I'm still depressed from last week. Totally. At least you've got some Super Bowl rings and you've been. Uh, my, my Detroit Lions have never been to the Super Bowl. They're one of the four teams that haven't been. It's totally yeah, we're, we'll do a separate podcast on that. But I actually, yeah. I was actually in New Orleans when Brett Favre won that one. So I can at least say I, I very cool. Very that cool. One. So let's go back to this. Now, um, we're talking today, sleep physiology. And, and let's put our business hat on for a second. You know, every dentist that you talk to, they're passionate about this. They want to differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack. Like this is a very important thing to just start becoming aware of the signs and what you see in sure. and how does physiology relate to this whole conversation? What are some other things or even misconceptions we have about physiology? Yeah. So a lot of people will think that uh, if somebody snores, uh, patients will think if they snore, it's just snoring, okay? That it's just a noise that they make. When in reality, there's a very high correlation between snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. It's not diagnostic, but there's a strong correlation to when there's a reduction in flow and that sound is rippling through the airwave, there's a likelihood that that person has sleep apnea. Um, the other thing that is a misconception for us then is we look at these patients who snore and we think they all have sleep apnea. And that's not true either. There's just, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's a causation we see patients who snore and don't have apnea and we see patients who don't snore and have apnea so there's a misconception there also the misconception is that the the problem is dry throat hoarse in the morning uh, loud keeps their spouse awake as well right. no what we're concerned about is cardiovascular disease heart attacks congestive heart failure arrhythmias stroke depression diabetes all of those comorbidities are made much worse when a patient has obstructive sleep apnea. We've got a graph that shows the ambient number of people in a population by age that has any particular one of those diseases. And then when you look at the outside of that graph, there'll be those little dotted lines and they show you how many more people have that disease if they have obstructive sleep apnea. If you have an arrhythmia today, if you go into your doctor and he notices an irregular heart rate, the first thing they check is sleep apnea because that's the number one cause. Drug-resistant hypertension, number one cause, okay? A person with obstructive sleep apnea is not two or four or eight or 16 times more likely to die of a heart attack. They're 23 times more likely to die of a heart attack because mm -hmm. of the stress and the strain that's put on the heart. Mm -hmm. It gets worse, Kirk, because somebody who's snoring probably is a little bit of a mouth breather. And if you're a mouth breather, you don't take in enough nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is only made by breathing through the nose. So if you breathe through the nose during the day, you can make that up. But a lot of people who are snorers are just habitual mouth breathers. And so if they breathe through the mouth and don't breathe through the nose, they don't make enough nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the active ingredient in the little blue pill. Okay, that's fine. I wanna make sure that we all get enough nitric oxide for that very good reason. But more importantly, when somebody comes into your dental practice and has a little chest pain, they're complaining, you get the 70 year olds having a little chest pain while you're working on it because they're stress and tension. What do you do? You give them a nitroglycerin under their tongue. Nitroglycerin has as the active ingredient, uh-huh, nitric oxide, because nitric oxide is a vasodilator. That's how it works down there. And that's also how it works in your heart as a vasodilator. When we're challenged at night by these exacerbations of stress and the sympathetic arousal that we have to breathe, our heart is ill-prepared because it doesn't have the nitric oxide on board. And that's why they're 23 times more likely to have a heart attack, four times more likely to have a stroke, five times more likely to die of COVID if you get COVID because of the respiratory challenges. So there's this huge physiologic reaction that happens when you don't sleep well. For any reason, really, but for obstructive sleep apnea, especially because of these sympathetic arousals that just beat the heck out of your system. Right. And there's just not enough education around this all to begin with. Even when I was diagnosed, like it took, it took a lot of people. Like I didn't start taping my mouth until probably four years ago, five years ago. And now I've got the strips on it. It's a world of a difference. And it's amazing how ill-informed people are on just how to breathe even at night if they're breathing well. So we are ill-informed. Ill I'll tell you that. However, we're not we're ill-informed, but we're not ill-curious. 
And we're yeah. very curious as a people about sleep apnea. Right. In fact, if your listeners would right now take out their phones just for fun okay. and open up your browser. So mine's Chrome on my phone and you open up your, your Chrome browser and I don't want you to type anything I tell you. Open it up and you're ready to do a search and you're going to type in just two words. Type in the word why, W-H-Y, and type in the word am and tell me what comes up. A-M, am? Am, Y-A-M, why am? Okay, go. Why am I so tired? Why am I always so tired? Why am I always cold? Why am I peeing so much? Why am I so gassy? But the three out of the first five are having to do with being tired. Are you kidding me? So America is searching Google and Bing and Chrome and Netscape for information about why they're so tired and why they're sleeping. We're not informed as to how important it is from a comorbidity standpoint, right? but we certainly want to know why we feel like crap. And the media, no offense to the media, but I'm going to give some, they maybe don't help as much as they can because they sensationalize that which um, is headline worthy. Right. The Hoboken train disaster, the Exxon Valdez, a, a plane where the pilot falls asleep and, uh, and crashes into a mountain or something like that. Uh, Reggie White, the football player, Antonin Scalia, the Supreme Court justice, they sensationalize some of the outward untoward events, the car accidents, the motor vehicle, all of that stuff. Right. That does take lives, and I, I do care about that, but the number of lives that takes is pale in comparison to what happens from these comorbidities and the decreased life expectancy of a person that has obstructive sleep apnea. And they've done those studies. The Wisconsin court study is famous for looking at how many fewer in a population survived 20 years versus the control group that didn't have sleep apnea. There's a 53% survive, survival rate over 20 years if you have severe sleep apnea versus not having it. Right. 20 years, all ages, all causes of death. That's crazy. Yeah. There should be alarm bells going off. It's crazy. And that's true to the current state. I just think the architecture of our world and the future is just going to exacerbate this. I mean, now we've got devices everywhere, even us. I mean, I, you have to physically make a decision to go to bed, turn everything off, put your app, like everything away. I just feel like this is, this is an incredible opportunity for dentists to really step into this, understand how important it is, not only to the future health of the world, but it's going oh, yeah. to become a big challenge and your ability to see the algorithm, understand it within your practice is going to be a huge opportunity as you, for you as a dentist. Totally agree. You know, um, and, and the good thing is you and I talked earlier and when you were asking me about, you know, some of my why about, about wanting to get into sleep and everything. Right. And, and, and I waxed and waned a little bit about how important sleep was to me and my personal journey experience. And, and honestly, and, and I would always want to pay attention to that in my dental practice if I was practicing dentistry. But at the end of the day, we really tend to do a lot more of what we get paid for. And, and I mean paid for in a couple of different ways, of course. We get some warm fuzzies, we get some you know, attaboys, we get some uh, behavioral, some spiritual rewards about stuff that feels good. But then at the end of the day, we, we can only do so much of that right. if we didn't pay our bills. And so this idea of having something that you could do that is incredibly rewarding, Right. Emotionally. And is also incredibly rewarding financially. Yeah. And so so when you look at the average dental practice, and you'd have far more data than I would, when you look at the average production in a dental practice per hour, not one of your top clients, that's not fair, because your top clients do significantly better than the average dentist. That's for sure. I've seen you, I've seen your numbers. But when you look at the average dental practice before they start working with you and their production level, if they were doing sleep. Two hours in sleep would usually be two to three times per hour more right. than what they could do doing their everyday dental procedures, including Crown and Bridge. Right. So how do we not gravitate towards something that fills us inside and fills our wallet at the same time and saves lives and feels great? Oh, because it would require me to change. It would require me to think about medical billing. I'd have to pay somebody else. Oh, I don't want to do all that. Well, right. then that's okay. At least, and we'll talk about this in the next segment, at least screen your patients for sleep apnea. And if you don't want to treat them, at least give them the tap on the shoulder and send them to somebody who does. That'll yeah. be okay. 
And I can't wait to talk about it. So if you're listening to this series, do not miss the next one, as well as the others when we're going to be talking about screening. But um, I want to go back to what you just said, because in this, you know, and you'll love this because I had Erin Elliott on who just. Oh, yeah. Love Erin. The queen of good air she is. She's the queen of good air. She is. She is. And I'm like, well, how did you do this? And we were talking about our good friend Murph, who's she's like, listen, I don't have the luxuries. I just started with one day and a part of my column. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to go full bore on this point. Very good point. Very good point. And then slowly just it's like a dial. Just turn it up a little bit in your practice. The other thing you mentioned, which kind of blew my mind last time with the opportunities with COVID and teledentistry, you don't need to build an op, equip your office with a few more hand pieces in order for this to work. This just requires a pivot here. That's correct. Yeah, so, with, with telemedicine, we've been doing virtually all of our consults. Now, I actually did a face-to-face consult yesterday with an elderly gentleman who's got dementia and his wife brought him in and they were just a lovely couple. We visited for a while. We took care of that face-to-face. She just felt it would be challenging for him and her to do something like that in telemedicine. But we're doing all of our consults, virtually all of our consults, all of our follow-ups, all of our titration, all of those kind of down the road steps. Oh, I still take the impression in person. I still do the exam in person. I still take the bite relationship in person. I have them back in, in a couple, three weeks and I deliver the device in person. But so much of the rest of that can be done in and around other scheduling opportunities online on a right. phone call like this. So, so convenient, it's ridiculously convenient. I can't do that with a filling or a crown. I mean, there's so many things you can't do in dentistry that way. Um, you know, you can probably get a consult going with somebody who's having a problem with the tooth. Maybe you can assess whether they need to come in or go to the endodontist or, or go to the oral surgeon or something like that. But short of that, this is, yeah, some of your time is just spent on the phone. It's very easy. Yeah, this is awesome. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're going to go into the screening piece of it in our next one. But last couple last things that we'd want to know about physiology and then you know the other thing too is this isn't just a male problem this is a this is open now this is not just what we normally thought as a certain demographic or person or race or anything like that it's an open conversation now for anybody when it comes to the challenges with sleep you know it, it that's totally true male female tall short skinny fat now there are some tendencies so we can profile a person to say they're at higher risk than somebody else and we'll talk about that in screening extensively but let's first make sure that we're really clear on what sleep apnea is and what sleep apnea isn't i did say that there's a reduction in flow and that you your blood oxygen level drops a little bit now if you just hold your breath for a few seconds your blood oxygen level doesn't drop because we're breathing in deeply we're exhaling deeply but if everybody who's watching this right now just take a normal breath in Take a normal breath out. Great, we're gonna do that again. Take a normal breath in. Take a normal breath out. Now stop right there and hold it. Now you can breathe. That is 10 seconds. That's how long an apnea or a hypopnea has to last. It's not a brief respite from normal breathing. It's Uh 10 seconds with at least a 30% reduction in flow and your blood oxygen level has to drop three or 4%. Wow. Now, when you put those two together, your body says, eh, 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 alarm bells going off, we've got to fix you, breathe. So that's how severe, if that happens, think about it, two or three or four times an hour, that actually is normal. We see no significant change in comorbidities, physiology, responses, et cetera, to the occasional breathing episode. We test patients who think they might have apnea who have 0.5 episodes per hour, three episodes per hour. I have a patient we did a consult with just today, in fact, that had five one night and six the other night. So not sure we need to treat them, right? Right. Well, it does go a little bit deeper than that because when you look at their sleep test, which we'll talk about in one of the upcoming series, how low did his oxygen go when it went down? How much time did he spend below 90%? How high did his heart rate go? Does he have any daytime sleepiness, any cognitive issues? Right. So when you put together the whole thing, you look at their signs, their symptoms, you look at the test results you have, the objective measurements, and there's a lot that goes into deciding whether or not somebody does or doesn't have sleep apnea. And that's why we can get fooled because we already have this problem with the epiglottis, whoops, the uvula and the epiglottis not overlapping. Right. And in our first year of life, they grow apart. 
that's a walking upright, that's our larynx, all that stuff working. I'm good with that. Tongue falls back and closes that airway off. But why does the tongue do that? It, right. we, we can't be designed to do that. That can't be the natural way our body's supposed to work. And it's not. But if you look at pictures of mandibles and maxillas on skeletons from 8,000 years ago, they are ginormous. Right. Even up to about 400 years ago, where there was a little bit of elongation, right. there was not much protrusion. But in the last 400 years, our lower face has gone down and back, narrowed and gotten significantly smaller to the point that there's never, there's never any room for the wisdom teeth, almost right. never. And the lower incisors lean in instead of canting out. And so now this tongue, which is used for speaking, talking, and everything like that, stays robust in size. And then our bony box that holds the tongue, think of it that way, our bony box has gotten smaller. Right. Now talk and, about little changes, like, because there's all these hypotheses, less breastfeeding, less, you know, like. Absolutely. How, really? I love it. Just keep throwing me those softballs. I love it. All right. Let's, so breastfeeding, for example, if, if I, and when, when my kids were little, it's just horrible. I hope they're not listening. When my kids were little, and my, and my grandkids, we were much better with them, I would I'd have my daughter laying across my arm like this, and I would stick a bottle in her mouth vertically. So here's a water bottle, stick it in like this. Okay. Enjoy your dinner. Did you eat lunch like that, laying down? No, nobody does. No. Irritates the back of your throat, gurgles, tonsils enlarge, irritates the tissue, spitting up, all that kind of stuff. If you eat vertically, that doesn't happen nearly as much. Right. So if you were to swaddle babies, vertically put them right in the middle and let them go from breast to breast when they're small they're going to learn to latch on better right. they're going to feed better they're going to have less irritation mandibular and maxillary development will be better and then if we fed them paleo diets I'm, I'm not suggesting that but if we fed them paleo diets then they chew more nuts and berries and raw foods and then they'd use their lower face more and the maxilla and the mandible would grow a little bit larger because that's based on use and function and then, of course, if we as a society weren't as heavy as we are today, you look at the Midwestern diet, the Western diet, I'm sorry, I'm from the Midwest, and so, so are you, our Midwestern diet, I need some more uh, macaroni and cheese, and, right. and so, uh, but you look at our diet, and back in 1994, there was no state in the country, no state in the country in 1994 that had an obesity rate that was in excess of 20%. Today, actually in 2019, two years ago, there was no state in the country that had an obesity rate under 20% of the population of their state. Right. So we've gotten fatter as a nation. And these are the kinds of things that contribute to a, a situation where it's easier for the tongue to fall back and close the airway. Some people, if they sleep on the side, that helps. Right. But probably not enough. If you sit up a little bit, it helps. Probably not enough. So we've got all these forces that are making it harder and harder for us to keep our airways patent at night. They're working against us. And so the population of people with sleep apnea is growing. Right. So go back to this, because again, we're talking about physiology and yep. what happens inside the body, all that kind of stuff. You talked about oxygen being the nutrient. So that's one thing when that goes down, obviously, but talk about the cortisol or the stress response. I mean, we're not just talking about a lack of oxygen. We're talking a spike of other things. And I've heard other people say this. Would you agree? I don't need a sleep test. Let me just see the body's responses to stress in the morning, and I'll tell you whether or not they were breathing. Do you agree with that? I, I think you can get a very clear indication. I think from a from a physiologic standpoint where somebody wants to get paid by the insurance company, they're still going to need the AHI data, but you're spot on. When you look at that stress response, when somebody wakes up in the morning, high cortisol levels, low leptin, low ghrelin. Why? Because their digestive system is getting jacked around all night when they're supposed to be doing what they're doing. Eat your meal, go to sleep, right? All the digestion occurs. Oh no, because you're getting these bolts of lightning all the time. You're getting epinephrine and norepinephrine, and so leptin and ghrelin. So now obesity goes up. Uh, type two diabetes goes up, right? Cortisol levels go up, fight or flight stress mechanism. And you know, physiologic stress versus psychologic stress, very different in how it whacks with the body. If you are an animal on the Serengeti plane, and the lion comes along and chases you, big epinephrine rush, you run, you get away, <sighs> all the epinephrine goes away and you relax, go back to grazing. But when we're thinking all the time like we do about things, we're continually raising that cortisol, epinephrine, stress, fight or flight mechanism. And some of us are getting jacked bodies during the day as well. No question about that. 
Oh uh, gosh, I there's I've got a bajillion questions, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I get, know I keep trying to hold you back when you start know, to lean in. I, I want to get into the lean in the screening. I hold you back. I want to go to end right away. I, you know how I, I, you know, we're going to take our time going through this. And that's why I'm so got, so glad you guys are here. Now I'm going to pause just for some show. Cause you're going to see, I have a great team of writers. So if you guys are listening to this right now, do yourself a favor, just go to the show notes. You're going to see all of Mark's contact information and then all of this. Now, and this one, we probably won't have some slides, but we'll have future slides. And other. We'll have slides for the next one. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So just go there and continuously reference some of this stuff. And then again, reach out to Mark if you have questions, because I hope this is hitting some hot buttons for you because you see it everywhere. You see it in your family, you see it in patients, all that stuff. Let's bring physiology home. Like what are some of the last points we need to do before we move on to the next piece? So it, it, just because we are using a term like physiology and I feel like we do drift a little bit in our conversations and this should be conversational. This is a very practical conversation rather than this isn't a university class on sleep and this isn't a, a lecture that I'm giving at the Hammond meeting or something like that. So, you know, we spend all day using our bodies and exercising. We spend all day using our minds and exercising our minds. That's great. But we can't do that 24 hours a day, multiple days in a row. You will die. Right. Okay. So we know that. We know that if, if there's a lack of sleep, we'll die. So you say, well, okay, I don't want a total lack of sleep because I know we'll die. So I'm going to rest. And uh, I don't want to miss anything, so I'm going to rest as little as possible. Maybe I'll even screw up my, my rest more by drinking alcohol or taking drugs or, or being stressed or all these kind of things. But for a second, let's pretend somebody's, you know, really trying to pattern themselves. They go to bed at night. What's supposed to happen? Well, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to spend roughly 25% of your time in deep sleep, 25% of your time in dream sleep or REM, and the other half of your time in those early different stages of sleep. So, so think about this. You fall asleep. And you kind of start off in this early physiologic stage one sleep. You go to stage two sleep. Those are kind of like light sleep. And then you go down into deep sleep, stage three. And that kind of is your pattern the first half of the night. The second half of the night, one, two, sometimes a little bit of three, but mostly you go down into REM sleep. So it's not as perfect as this. But if you look at a lot of, they're called hypnograms. We'll look at them in a later session. If you look at a lot of hypnograms of people, we're supposed to go stage one, stage two, deep sleep the first half of the night, stage one, stage two, REM sleep the second half of the night. Very few wake-ups, a couple an hour. Okay, great. When we don't get enough deep sleep, we don't, you were talking about hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, leptin, ghrelin. We don't get enough growth stimulating and growth hormone. When you don't get enough of that, your body that wanted to run ultra marathons, I'm sorry, not ultra marathons, triathlons, my body that ran a lot of marathons, doesn't get to heal as well. My musculoskeletal healing is compromised when we don't get enough growth hormone. So the first half of the night, we kind of heal our bodies. Oversimplified sleep physiology, we heal our bodies. The second half of the night, we heal our minds in dream sleep. In dream sleep, we're consolidating memories, learning patterns, so we know that when we don't have that over a chronic period of time, we start to see in those people often a loss of some of their cognitive capabilities. There's tremendous research today that's indicating there might be a little bit of a buildup of some of those amyloids that we see in Alzheimer's, in dementia, in Lewy body, so that we think jack sleep causes all these physiologic concerns we do and other things that come back to haunt us later in life when things aren't working as well because we didn't get enough physiologic rest to our musculoskeletal system or rest for our brains up here. Yeah. That whole thing just creates a physiologic firestorm for those patients. Now we're humans. Give me triplets, identical genetic material, identical twins, jack with one sleep, don't jack with the other sleep, make the other one fat, give them obstructive sleep apnea, three different responses. Make them all the same, still could get three different responses. We don't know why some people are more impacted by this and others are less impacted by this. That's always gonna be one of the quizzes that never gets answered in physiology. But we do know that if you take a population and you run them through this gambit of obstructive sleep apnea, a much higher percentage of them present with all the kinds of problems we're talking about. Are there exceptions to the rule? Absolutely. That's why people still smoke, drink too much, drive crazy, don't wear seatbelts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, my Uncle Joe smoked two packs a day, drank a fifth of booze, lived to be 95. 
Yes, but for every Uncle Joe, there's 14 Uncle Ben's who died young. Right. And that's the physiological response we get. It jacks with us. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. And uh, dude, I'm so excited. Uh, well, I mean, this is, this is serious stuff, but this is also an incredible opportunity, like I said. And so um, I'm just grateful you're on. This is, again, a first part of a six-part series and today we were talking about sleep physiology. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. You're going to see if you just toggle down to the next episode, we're going to get into the screening part of it and into the details. And you'll love with every progression we make, Mark's going to go a little bit more and more specific to show you how you could apply this all the way to the end to the billing part which I can't wait to see, which will be fun. So let's do this. So guys, if you enjoyed today, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends, keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to show. I want to remind you that you can check out the show notes and contact Dr. Murphy himself uh, and see the great things that he does. And he is awesome at being able to help you along the way and help you see great perspective. You'll also enjoy him as a human being. So check it out. So Thank you guys for tuning in the Best Practices Show. We'll see you in the next episode. Until we see you next time. I'm keep, going to take a nap. Go take a nap and keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.